to all those above me that watch over me, to all of you, my fave para peeps on this side of the veil, welcome. This is Reverend Sean Whittington's Paranormal Ministry. I'm your host, Reverend Sean, the Rev. Welcome to my haunted house, my very haunted house. And welcome to the first Monday night episode of the Paranormal Ministry. We're going live two days a week now, Mondays at 5 and Fridays at 2 p.m. Pacific. So now you get me two days a week. So thank you all very much for being here. I don't have a show without each and every one of you. So God bless you all. You're all on the prayer list. And I know that you all tuned in for my guest tonight. And she's phenomenal. And if you don't already know her and love her by the time the show's over with, you're going to love her. So I will get to her ASAP. Let's do the prayer urn. Anna P. from Georgia. Rev, I'm getting married Saturday. Oh, congratulations, Anna. I'm a widow. He's a widower. Both are bringing children from previous marriages into our marriage. Pray for us. (laughs) Wow, we've got a a real-life Brady Bunch. That is phenomenal. So that is this Saturday. Okay, pray for you. I will offer you up, you and your husband. You should have put your husband's name on there, Anna. But I will offer up a special prayer for you guys for your upcoming wedding. And we are in June. Is that a thing? I think that's a thing, isn't it? June wedding? I think that's a thing. Well, congratulations. That is nice. Okay, this is a very beautiful one. Brothers and sisters, my paranormal ministry family, for Anna and her husband and her children and their new adventure, I would like you all to add some positive vibe and some love and light to this prayer. So just when I'm praying it, just reach out, touch your computer screen, close your eyes, bow your head. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, from you, every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. Father, you are love and life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman, and through the Holy Spirit, fountain of divine charity, grant that every family on earth may become for each successive generation a true shrine of life and love. Grant that your grace may guide the thoughts and actions of husbands and wives for the good of their families and of all families in the world. Grant that the young, may find in the family solid support for their human dignity and for their growth in truth and love. Grant that love, strengthened by the sacrament of marriage, may prove mightier than all the weaknesses and trials through which our families sometimes pass. Through the intercession of the Holy Family of Nazareth, grant that the church may fruitfully carry out her worldwide mission in and through the family, through Christ our Lord, who is the way, the truth, and the life forever and ever. Amen. That was a beautiful prayer. Anna, God bless you and your husband. You know what? You didn't ask for this, but I'm going to light a big candle for you and your family and your wedding this coming up Saturday. Uh, Anna, this prayer, this candle will stay lit with me the rest of the show, and then I will take it lit into the room where all the other candles are burning, and it'll continue to burn until it's done burning for you and your your wedding coming up. May the Holy Spirit enter and intervene in the lives of you and your husband and your children, and bless your upcoming wedding, and stay with you guys in the remainder of this journey and on to the next for all of you. Amen. Okay. Paranormal Ministry Mailbag. Boom. Lisa J. from Las Vegas. Hey, I'm in Las Vegas. Moved into a haunted home. Mm. What are ghosts? And what's the difference between ghosts and demons? You know what? I think I'm going to save this question. 
and even ask it of my guest tonight because this is right up her alley. But I will give you the quick and short answer all into one from me real quick. Uh, my mother always told me ghosts are just people without a body any longer. Nothing to be afraid of. If one appears to you, it either has a message or uh, it needs your help. If you can help it, fine. If you can't, that's okay. Let it know you can't. If it's got a message for you after you receive its message, if you're freaked out by ghosts, you just tell it. Listen, you're freaking me out. Don't appear to me any longer, but I pray for you. Go to heaven. Um, demons. The difference between a haunt and an infestation of the demonic is life and death. They are there to kill you. If you suspect you have malevolent forces in your home, get help. Get in touch with local clergy and get some help. Uh, but I'm going to ask my great guest to comment on that too. Anything you want to know about my wife and I and our ministry work, go to our website, www dot ghost dash b dash gone dot biz the ministry uh if you go there remember that my wife and i don't charge for our ministry work helping people with their paranormal issues so i know times are tough brothers and sisters but if you notice the donate button and you're able to do so click on it and send in a small donation i promise you it'll be appreciated from the bottom of our hearts and trust me we will put it to good use um in addition to being an ordained exorcist, I'm also a spiritual advisor. So there's an area there where you can make an appointment with me to speak with me about spiritual issues that you may be having, not attached to the paranormal. But don't leave the website without navigating over to the page called the WSE course slash book. On that page, you'll find my new haunted autobiography, God, Ghosts, and the Paranormal Ministry. And I quote, scariest book I ever published. That was Annette Munich. Owner of Stellium Books, my publisher, but don't let that scare you off of purchasing a copy. The good thing about the book is part of the proceeds of every sale of every copy of my book goes to support stjude.org, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Nevada, and the ASPCA. So you get to help the animals a little bit. And if there was ever a better time to get the book, it's now because da -da, there is going to be a God, Ghosts, and the Paranormal Ministry 2, Chronicles of an American Exorcist book, coming out summer 2022. So now you can get this, the first one, catch up. And I do update in the second book some of the stories that I left kind of open-ended in the first book. Um, you can get the book a little less expensive at Amazon. You can also get an autographed copy enclosed in a house blessing kit on the website. Scroll a little further down and you'll see the Worldwide Society of Exorcists, which I am a founding member. I offer, I'm the instructor, I offer a college level online course, Introduction to Spiritual Warfare through the WSE. And this is the course for all of you true warriors for Christ out there that feel a calling and a longing to wanna to have more knowledge when it comes to um, drawing your line in the sand, circling the wagons, making a stand, putting up a good fight against, God forbid, true evil if it ever comes calling. That's the course for you. You can enroll in the course there at the website, but if you'd like more information on the course before making that type of commitment, there's a Worldwide Society of Exorcists Facebook page or call me, send me a message. We can talk about the course, make sure it's a right move for you. Most importantly, please keep all of my former, current, and future students in your prayers. Thank you very much. Okay, the reason why you all tuned in here. I love her. I respect her. She's one of the most knowledgeable paranormal authorities that I know on all things paranormal. An experiencer, an elite paranormal investigator, a psychic, an author. Man, she's written some awesome books. She's the creator of ghosthuntingtheories.com, the blog, I believe it's, she'll, she'll go, all, she'll tell you all about it, but I like number one or number two in the world blog, number eight paranormal blog, or she'll tell you, but I mean, it's a very popular blog. It's an awesome blog. I'm, I'm there all the time. She just recently published a couple of 
phenomenal articles on there that I read over the past couple of days. So without further ado, brothers and sisters, please welcome to the show the one and only Sharon Day. Hi. Sharon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love you. I'm so happy yeah. to see you. I know. You. It just reminds me of those Octobers when we would be hosting shows and uh, just bouncing off each other. Listen. I know you're one of the busiest people on the planet. Um, in addition to all the other things people know that you do, there's things behind the scenes that people don't know that you do. And I know we can't talk about it. You're screenwriting for a production company and lots of good things coming down the pike with all of that. But I want to address something right off the bat because there's people tuning in tonight that love you, that are fans and followers of you, that know that you've kind of had a little bit of a rocky Roller, sco- roller coaster of a ride of life mm-hmm. here yeah. recently, mm-hmm. and I'm just going to throw it out at you. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a brother-in-law with Bell's palsy. Um, I have friends who have it. I have a couple of childhood friends I've known all my life struggling with it, and some of your fans and followers who also have it have reached out, and they're looking forward to hearing from you tonight because you handled getting that like the champion that I knew you are and you're conquering it like no one that I know. And I know people now that are in such deep depression over it. Mm -hmm. People want to hear from you, how you, how you handled it the way you did. And if you have any advice for some people out there that may be suffering. Oh, sure. I'm just about to make the one year mark. I was bilateral. Uh, One side went out in June, last June, and the other side two months later. So I had a weak side trying to help the the, uh, the, uh, the other side that just went down. And it's been very slow. The lips are still having a lot of trouble. Um, Raising the eyebrow on one side is difficult. Uh, The eyes still want to water and stuff. Um, People with bells understand what you're up against. Now, a great majority of people that get it uh, it, it, it's an inflammation of the nerves, that, the facial nerves that lead into your face from the cranial nerve. And uh, it can be caused, what they believe is usually a virus. And in my case, I had a cold sore on one side. That side went down. Two months later, I had a cold sore on the other side, and the other side went down. It, it doesn't mean having cold sores is always going to cause it. But I also silently had diabetes and didn't know it. So uh, I, I looked at it as a warning sign. It was telling me, Sharon, your immune system's not not working. And I sought the right help to be sure that I got myself in a healthy regimen. Um, I lost 40 pounds. Wow. Yeah. And just like and you didn't and have, have you <laughs> didn't have 40 pounds to lose. I don't look like it. I carry my weight. Well, I'm kind of large frame with wide shoulders, so I, I can hide weight really well. But it, on BMI scale, I would have been considered obese. So I did need to lose that. And it did affect uh, my blood pressure and my blood sugar to being normal. So uh, I look at, I I look at life this way. My favorite saying in the world is there are no obstacles in your path. The obstacles are the path. So every time I hit a wall in my life, I just say, oh yeah, well, I'm a Viking. I can, I can do this. I, you know, and I used to do that as a kid with the boys because I would compete with boys. I'd be like, oh, you think you could shoot me out in basketball? No, I'm sorry. I'm a three pointer. So uh, I just decided first educate yourself, learn everything you can about it. Uh, Your doctor's probably going to tell you, here's our standard way that we treat it. And they still really don't understand it. It it heals on its own in almost all cases. Uh, Some people are left with a little bit of residual. Uh, I refuse to have any residual. So I am monitoring myself where I actually videotape and photograph myself weekly to see Mm -hmm. what changes there are, because when you're having it, you don't see the changes, but it becomes apparent, yes, you are getting better. Uh, It meant uh, a lot of stress reduction and a lot of facial massage really, really helped a lot. But on on ghosthuntingtheories.com, you'll find um, an article about Bell's palsy there, and it's my ongoing diary of how it's been going for me. And I encourage people, if you're having trouble with it and you really need a perspective or you need somebody to hold your hand or tell you this is normal or whatever, uh, my email is ghosthuntingtheories at gmail.com. Just contact me. I, I think no one should go through this alone. 
Oh my gosh! You, you, as you were talking, you were giving me, the, you know, the goosebumps because it's just uh, I can feel uh, how much help that is giving to those that need it. Listening to you, and you, you are I, I don't I know no one like you that tackled uh, this the way that you did, and so that should be yeah. something that people that are suffering from that um, should really take note of. Uh, what about the depression? What did you do about to keep from just going? <sighs> <laughs> well, at first, I kind of handled it by asking for a medication. So I actually got on Zoloft because I, I, I just got new health diagnoses, and my whole life just sort of stopped. And I, it was, I was having trouble eating. I could only do liquids. I was drooling all the time. You know, I just, it wasn't me. Uh, one thing that I do believe in is manifesting, and that's how I've always gotten through things in life. If you look at, okay, I used to be a model. I used to do pageants. So I, I'm not vain, but I, I like to be attractive. And I didn't recognize this face, and I, was, I felt like a hermit. You know, like I just don't want anyone to see me looking this way. But my problem is target fixation. If you keep focusing on where you are now, you're going to drive yourself to stay there. You're not going to see any other way to go. You're going to actually be focused on all the flaws. And so I would pull out pictures and videos and things of me when I could smile normally. And, and I would go, you know what? I'm going to be, now that I'm even 40 pounds thinner, I'm even going to look better smiling. And I just kept manifesting toward where I wanted to go instead of looking at where I am or where I've been the last few months. So try not to focus too much on the physical appearance of yourself. Just think that this gave you insight into your immune system, your health. It made you have to slow down and not be so stressful. And you can literally, from all this massaging and all the facial exercises, you will be better looking when you're done. <laughs> so yay. Well, you know that I love you. You know that I, as soon as, you know, I heard you reached out to me and told me, I think we, I had you scheduled for a show and you said, this is what just happened to me. I can't do it. I, yeah, um, I could hardly talk at the, the time because both sides were fighting, you know. I, you went on, well, you were already on the prayer <laughs> list, but I started praying for you hot and heavy at that time. And I still mm -hmm. do. Um, okay. But so what you're saying though, for some of these people that don't see a light at the end of the tunnel is there always a light at the end of the tunnel with this or, or in some cases? Absolutely. No. I mean, there are some treatments and some surgeries and things they can do, but honestly, just, you're just going to, you just need to sweat it out. Don't miss a day of massaging because the muscles tighten a lot because they're atrophied. It's like a person that's been in a wheelchair and can walk again. You're going to have to build those muscles up. So you need to do the exercises. You need to do the massages several times a day. You have to be religious about that. Um, but it, you know, everybody comes around and you know, a, a lot of famous people have had it. Uh, George Clooney, Angelina Jolie, Roseanne Barr, uh, just a ton of people have had it that are famous and doing just fine. And they're smiling and they're beautiful and you'd never know they had it. Um, just manifest, imagine being even better than you were before. Well, if I was there, I'd give you a big hug and a kiss. You know that. Oh, thank um, you. I'm I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Uh, and you look very pretty today. And to me, Thank you're you. the same old Sharon Day. So. Well, thanks. Um, what else do I want to say to you? <laughs> you are so active, and you. Know, it seems like <laughs> even during all that time when there was probably only you and God know how how dark some of the ride was. Mm -hmm. But you see, I mean, you're you're always urbexing. You're always out with your your other paranormal um, enthusiasts, uh, urbexing buddies, you know, doing mm -hmm. that, paranormal investigations. Did that slow you down much or were you determined it's not going to? I'm still going to do what I love to do and what I'm passionate about. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think mostly the only thing that gets in the way of that is is just the schedule, the things I'm trying to do. I mean, I'm keeping, I just uh, had a, a researcher. He's about 85 years old. He's been researching for over 60 years, but he's such a mountain man hermit that he would go back to his cabins and just dump his souvenirs and things he found and casts of Bigfoot and stuff, just put them in there. And I said, you know what? We really need to archive this. So he came to my house for two weeks and 
we went through archiving and all the photos and all the notes and every detail. Uh, I didn't want information like that lost. And in fact, one of the things he found that he showed me photos of blew my mind because it was found in a very hidden cave in the Southwest. It was a, a set of two, uh, there was four different statues and it, a little like stone shrine that was set up in the cave. And you could see the cave walls had carvings in it and had been shaped and it was very purposeful. But the, what baffled me was these statues. What the heck are they? So my research partner, Dennis Gurn and I, we went back and forth and finally Dennis said, I know where they're from. And I, I'm like, where? And he said, the Marquesas Islands out in the South Pacific. <laughs> and I looked at the statues. And this is in Arizona they were found. It was not in Arizona, but in the Southwest, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. And so I'm going, okay, this, okay, I'm going to try to make sense of this. Because at first I thought, oh, Aztec treasure or something, you know. Uh, didn't match up with any of the Aztec stuff. Uh, but when you look at the Marquesas Island statues, they're very mysterious. They don't know who carved them. Some of them are giant. Some of them are six-fingered. But their looks are very, very alien. Big, bulbous eyes and long heads. Uh, it, it's strange looking, very strange. But these are absolutely identical. And so I, I looked it up. Marquesas Islands are like 4,000 miles off of Mexico, which yeah. means a, a seafaring people really could have hit Mexico and traveled up. You know, And this could have been one of many places they just stopped and, and settled in or whatever. But uh, we're going to make an expedition to that cave and document it thoroughly. Do you have a, a theory, or maybe you, you might be spot on with an answer already? What this is a big find. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I, it, it, even though it, it's not my thing, it's I, I, <laughs> yeah. I know. So <laughs> why why isn't something like that all over the news? Is it because uh, this uh, person that found these statues doesn't own his own television station? I mean, is that is it this, come, is know, it something like that? Yeah, I'll be honest. As much as this man has accrued unbelievable evidence, it's very rare he ever sat still long enough to because he goes all over the world. He he didn't sit still long enough to realize the importance of what he had found. In fact, he he just took a photo of it and left. And at the time, he was having kidney stones. He said he had to get to the hospital, but you know. It just amazes me that he didn't realize uh, the importance of what he had found. And that's something that we definitely want to document. But when I, I look at this, my automatic assumption at this point is what we would call the giant culture or the, uh, the originators, the first culture that did the megalithic uh, types of stuff that uh, hit Easter Island, made the Moai statues, left Easter Island, went to Peru. Peru has legends of these giants arriving. And uh, obviously, I would say the obvious place for them to have come from was the was Easter Island, what they call the Long Ears. Uh, they arrived there. And in the legends, it says they had dug wells and lined the wells with some weird tar-like substance. And everybody always thought that this was just, you know, some silly native legend. But not too long ago, they found the wells and they were lined with some kind of substance. So there's something in this repeated giant story that we cannot overlook. So going from what I thought might be an Aztec treasure to possibly a giant cave uh, is actually more exciting than gold. <laughs> well, you knew, you knew where this conversation was going to go once you said the word giant. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And before I bring uh, the big hairy guy into this conversation, mm -hmm. um, I'm of the opinion that, you know, you could categorize Bigfoot in amongst some of the uh, original indigenous giants, but I believe there were some giants that were actually closer to us that were legitimate giants. You're a psychic, you're a, an elite investigator and researcher and all that stuff. You've been doing this a long, long, long time. Um, in your heart of hearts, your best guesstimation, what do you think happened to these giants? I think we can look back at the legends. I think a couple of different things were against them. One of the things that was against them was they were cannibalistic, uh, did not make them a good thing for any of the native people. And I think the native people outbred them. I think it was much harder to birth a live giant child, given the way their skulls were. Um, it probably just bottlenecked population wise. 
And then in the legends of natives, they said they had an uprising where they went against the giants, even different tribes that were not friendly tribes with each other got together to kill off these giants. So you have today some giants in the forest who are hiding from us and no, they shouldn't have contact with us. And I, I find that interesting, especially when their populations are near a lot of the locations like the Cahokia mounds and, uh, and some of the, the areas along the Mississippi where the tribe said they had driven the, the giants away. So I, I think we have to look at something very logical here. We had giant skeletons found in America and today we still have giants. We also have legends that show why the giants are hiding. Now you can put people in a feral situation long enough, they're gonna get hairy. Even a, a regular <laughs> homo sapien is gonna grow very thick body hair living outdoors. Uh, it, that's not, not unusual, but um, you know, they, their knowledge seems to be very, they seem to be extremely intelligent but they don't need to use technology. And that's, I think, something that natives really understood, the spiritual aspect, the aspect of them being able to use consciousness in ways we don't understand and to build megalithic structures or even just to cloak themselves within a forest. You know, it's so weird, interesting that you said that. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna put your feet to the fire on this. Mm -hmm. I love the new show that's out. Uh, I, I can count on one hand the people that I even listen to when they want to give me an opinion about Bigfoot. You're one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I love the show Expedition Bigfoot. Mm. And I, I, you know, over the last few years, I've lost track of how many times I've said to people, the longer I'm in this field, even what I do, deliverance ministry and ghost hunting, ghost busting, uh, the less I feel I know. The longer I'm in it, the less I feel I know. And now watching this show, for lack of a better term, I'm going to use confusion. I'm more confused now than ever before about mm -hmm. what I used to just think was Harry out there. Um, and he's just waiting to get run over by a, a station wagon and drug back to the home and live with the family. <laughs> Eat so a here I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and here I am, you know, thinking that I, you know, I've talked to many people like you mm -hmm. about what I thought was my own experience with Bigfoot and they, and they firmly believe I did have an encounter. So this show, what I've gotten out of this show, which now blows my mind is the cloaking. You mentioned the cloaking, mm -hmm. the infrasound, the theory of the infrasound and the theory of the interdimensional travel. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's so much spirituality thrown on there. And, you know, I'm a big, I love God and I believe every. Mm -hmm. We're all here because of God, and they're part of God's creature and God's plan. So I do believe there's a lot of spirituality and supernatural stuff going on with this creature. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you a quick story. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who reminds me so much of you. <laughs> but she's not into Bigfoot, but she lives up in the great Northwest. Oh, good. An avid hiker goes out there with her dogs hiking. And here's the crazy thing. Totally not into Bigfoot. Totally could care less. She's having a conversation with a girlfriend who happens to say, you know, you live in an area that's, you know, known for Bigfoot. Have you ever had a Bigfoot sighting? And it wasn't until that moment that it, and I believe she's psychically gifted. I don't know if she's ever admitted that to me, but here this vision comes rushing back to her like a bolt of lightning, an encounter that she had that her memory had suppressed. And she totally forgot about it. Her and her dogs came upon this Bigfoot crouching on the side of a stream. And it looked up at her, never moved its lips or anything. Mm -hmm. But she clearly heard this thing tell her, you don't see me. You need to get home. You're tired. You need to get home. You don't see me. Yeah. And that's all she remembered. Even her dogs stopped dead in their tracks. Um. So now, here we go. The cloaking, the infrasound, you know, um, the interdimensional travel. Another thing this show has brought up, the paranormal activity that is, surrounds these sightings. Yes. Whether it's UFO or just the glowing orbs in the forest. Okay, you, the show's yours now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, you just, I just laid a bunch of stuff on you now that... Yeah. that 
what is going on? What's the what can you tell us now where where the Bigfoot research is at? And in your heart of hearts and your professional opinion, okay. where are yeah. we at with this research? I think we are approaching that moment that the government recently had with UAPs, where we know that we've always gone tee hee 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 every time we hear about these things. And then we think we have a way in our mind because being three-dimensional biologic beings, we tend to think of things separately and, and there is no magic and there, and anything that's, uh, you know, woo woo has got to be just a belief system or it's spiritual and it doesn't have to be spiritual. There are things in nature that occur that still baffle us. I mean, we have trouble explaining, you know, gravity and, and magnetism. So they're in, they seem very magical when you look at them. I'm just, wow, you know, why is this happening? And I think we have to get to that point with Bigfoot. I know it sounds, and it makes people uncomfortable to think of Bigfoot as having qualities we don't have because we're supposed to be superior. They just have different qualities. I don't look at a chameleon changing colors and go, wow, why don't I have that? Is he better than me? It's what the chameleon needs. And these, these beings, whether... You want to call them Nephilim, that they're, you know, part angelic and they, they ride in two worlds. That, that's a good legend way of saying it. And it, it's something we need to listen to because legends have a seed of truth. When you watch, uh, say, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch and you see these sort of portal things opening up and things coming in and out of it, uh, we, ca we can't deny what we're seeing. We can't deny there's some science behind how this occurs. And I know from encounters I've had with uh, what I'd say are alien greys, that mind speak is a perfectly natural way to communicate. And uh, the person who's receiving the mind speak, basically it's not so much that they're hearing the words, they're translating them. They're, they sort of understand what's being meant. And then they put it in their own words in their head, sort of. Uh, and I think that if these guys have that capability, they have um, a step up on us. But any psychic who's done good reads knows what mind speak is. And it, it's just a talent. It's not some, you know, it's not like, you know, Uncle Martin on, you know, the, the, out, the what's that show with the, uh, the alien uncle? Oh, you know, my yeah. favorite Martian. My favorite Martian, yeah. It's been a while <laughs> since I've seen it. But yeah. no, I mean, he's not good. he doesn't have antennae, and, you know, he's not necessarily jumping on UFOs and coming and going. But he does have some abilities that our physics haven't yet explained. And it's going to be something in the quantum realm. Uh, you know, you look at our science, and, we, you know, we started out looking at stuff microscopically and going, wow, there's bacteria and viruses. And then... You know, before you know it, we're down to an atomic level. And now we're talking about quantum. And quantum is almost a theoretical explanation for the dance of life, you know. We're getting closer to the source. But we'll never learn anything if we keep going, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to admit I believe Bigfoot's interdimensional. Yeah. And, and that may not be the answer. It may not be. It may not be Nephilim. He may not be Anunnaki or anything else you think he is. Um, he just may have develop or been given or blessed skills that would help his purpose. You're one of the few psychics I know that have actually gone out and had, I always joke with you and say you went on, <laughs> on, a, on a date with Bigfoot, but you went out there and you psychically connected with um, them probably on more times than you've admitted to me. And you yeah. said one of the most interesting things about them I'd ever heard anybody say, uh, it was, you, you said it was like, they're like a survivor man met rain man and you 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 yeah you gave them a, a label something savant what did you well there, it was sort of like they were autistic savants in yes, a way that's it. That's they're it. very yeah. ocd about lining things up and the way that they keep memories is like they make a sound and when they make that sound everybody in their clan their tribe whatever you want to call it they all have the same recall memory from that sound and they're just very right brained type of beings but they also have a very different visual field than ours uh they definitely were built for and meant for nighttime and the way they see things in the daytime is so bright and so acute it reminds me of 
what people explain with near-death experiences when they go to heaven and the colors are colors we don't have and they have like a life in them. They literally can see the life force and the things around them. So in a, in a weird way, if you want to be simplistic, it's like they do have one foot in the angelic and one foot on the earth because they, they do see things in a dimension we don't see. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to throw, throw another weird question at you. <laughs> you probably didn't expect it coming. And it's only because I had several people ask me to ask. Oh, you. Okay. <laughs> and you can say, no, well, you know, I'm not ready to comment on that right now. <laughs> um, once upon a time, everybody said, oh my gosh, if there was ever two people that more deserved to be together, it was Sharon and Denny. And then... <laughs> There was a, some weirdness there for a little bit, and now people are want to know. We know Denny's around, and everybody's oh, like, oh, oh yeah. Go to yeah. Denny's. No, not the Denny's you eat at. Dennis, mm -hmm. um, I love him. Tell him I said hi. Oh, good. Yeah, he loves you too. He wants to um, be back on again, so we've got to get gotta, that going. Yeah, I wanted to get this one out of the way with you, and make mm -hmm. sure you're okay, and then I got to get you guys back on. I think I'm already booking for September of this Ooh. year and i know that gives you the whole you're very active in the summer that gives mm -hmm. you and him and i know you got some ex some exploring scheduled with him and other yeah. investigators and researchers i figured you're going to have a plethora of stuff to lay on us mm -hmm. probably in september and that's in that's your oh your... seriously yeah it, it, in fact i just painted the walls in the office room here uh this is a house that we're getting together and uh and we're setting up this office to make it an ideal place to go through mysteries that would blow the mind. We have a lot of things we want to reveal. We want to film. We want to follow up on. Um, but no, Dennis and I are tight. Yeah. Well, it's funny that, you know, I have my pray. I pull out of my prayer urn, a woman that's getting married. Might mm -hmm. there be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a date for you. Not yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> we have to meet certain criteria and all okay. of the things are getting done. But yeah, no, I, I, plus I would never get married in the heat. I'm, I'm not a June bride. I'm in Phoenix. I, is yeah, that a thing? I, I asked it. Yeah. I, I'm not, is, I think yes, I've heard that June brides, June wedding. Yeah. yeah. It, it's that and Valentine's day. They're booked up years ahead. It's hard to get, you know, a venue. Did you hear that now they're getting on, uh, they're, they're getting on the, the Elvis, Whoever is still in charge of all of that Elvis stuff. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they're yeah. cracking down on the Elvis impersonators here in town that marry people because they oh. want a piece of the action. So I don't know how that's going to turn out, but oh wow! Well, yeah. my dream, my dream wedding is barefoot outdoors, and it's the theme is romancing the stone. Oh my gosh, that would be beautiful. You know that dance scene they have there, and in, in, uh, in with the cantina with all the lights, the night lights hanging up and they dance and stuff and the outfits they're wearing. And then because we're both rock collectors, I would love to do a, a geode cake or something like that, or a cake with a big emerald on the top. It was so funny that you bring that up. I, they just had a triple feature, I, like midnight <laughs> to four to five in the morning. They had like the triple feature. They had uh, Romancing the Stone, Jewel of the Nile. Mm -hmm. And then they went into a movie that is so different for the two of them than the other two. It was uh where the married couple try to kill each other? Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and Miss, Danny DeVito's yeah. in that too. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, anyway, that was so different. I mean, here I watched the two of them all in love in these for four hours. Now they're in this movie where they they, they actually do kill each other. Spoiler yep. alert at the end. Yeah, the end. Yeah. Um, but they they were they were, were so the roses. Mad. That's yeah. it. That's it. They were yeah. so magical together as actress and actor. Or oh, yeah. actors um, that those yeah. were great movies, but yeah. Um, okay, where do I want to go now? I want to talk about my guest, uh, or actually the the question I pulled out of the mail bag. Mm -hmm. That was from Lisa J here in Las Vegas. Moved into a haunted house. Mm -hmm. What are ghosts, and what's the difference between ghosts and demons? Um, let me throw this out to everybody. www dot ghosthuntingtheories.com. It's a blog. You've had it forever. Where is it now on the ranking system? And it's up there. It's in the top 10 uh, the on last, both rankings. Yeah, the last, I think it was Reddit or somebody did the last poll and it was uh, number one for ghost hunting and number eight for paranormal in, in the, the world. world. Yeah. Great. And you just recently wrote two. I just wrote it down. I just read it and wrote it down. 
Uh, Understanding Hauntings in the Afterlife. Mm. Phenomenal article. Thank you. I think it's one of the most important things I've ever written, I think, Uh, just because in there I, I, I give you a visual of how it all works, at least the way that I see it. Talk to us about ghost and here you know my mm-hmm. like i said i was seeing them when i was very young when my mother she was the only one i confided in and she told me she kept it so simple and i kept that same approach just people without a body anymore they appear to you mm-hmm. it's almost like a blessing you're you know take it th- think of it as a a gift you're not scary although some spirits can be scary but it's usually just the antics they might play to get attention or the way they appear to you but not scary Mm -hmm. but uh you ask them if they have a message for you or or uh if you know they need help with something if you can help them great if you can't great if you don't want to see them any longer be honest with them and tell them Mm -hmm. so uh demons completely different story talk to all of the people out there that might be now let me throw this out to everybody else also and i'm doing this because i know somebody who lives in an area, I mean, she could throw a rock to a nearby Civil War uh, battlefield. She doesn't believe her home ever was used. Like, you grew up in a home that was used as a field hospital during the Civil War. You've written a book about it. Mm -hmm. Um, So you are, like I said, I can also talk to, I can count on two hands people that I will talk to about this topic lay it on my paranormal ministry family the world of spirits anything we didn't know that we should know or anything you want to share with us about your experiences or help this my neighbor out or Uh this person who lives near a civil war battlefield what do you talk to us about the world of ghosts well i always found that it's the probably one of the most important things about a a haunting in a home is that I can help people reframe the experience um, and empower them. And that's really more important to me than proving anything or showing, uh, you know, here's the EVPs, it's haunted, goodbye. (laughs) You know, like, what do I do now? (laughs) Um, Ghosts are lots of things. And it's absolutely a subjective thing, depending on how you were raised, uh, what religion you are, what you were told ghosts are by the media and movies and such. A lot of that colors the way we see the whole process as if they're invisible people, I guess you'd say. But when I was growing up, I grew up in a uh, a home that was built in the 1700s. It was taken over during the Civil War by the North. It was used as a field hospital. They built a fort on the property, so there was a lot of battles going on there. We dug up a lot of those relics. Uh, The house even had a cannonball in the wall. Um, It had those, the floors were stained with blood. At another part during the war, the South took it back and used it for the same purpose. So both sides had died in that house, which is a a bizarre and ironic situation. Uh, And the house had a stream running underneath it, which you couldn't make a better spirit vessel. So it was an interesting way to grow up. Now, I grew up there since I was a baby. To me, it was absolutely the way the world works. I had no question. I, I, you know, my older siblings were much older. When we moved into the house, they knew what ghosts were according to what they'd been told. And they knew it was haunted. I didn't see it as haunted. I just saw it as coexisting, you know, sort of like a parallel world happening in the same space. And now and then you catch a glimpse. And I could feel that. Sometimes I could walk the hall and feel I just passed something and I would turn and look at it. And I could feel like it startled and turned and went, what was that? So I'm a ghost to it, too. So you have all kinds of different kinds of ghosts, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. Some are just, and a great majority, are just recordings or moments in time that are tagged in a space and they replay. So you could be there, say, and see an apparition. We had a lot of these at, at Aspen Grove. Uh, you could see the same spirit doing the same thing, and it never saw you. It's like you're not even there. And that's sort of a replay. And it just takes the right conditions for something like that to get recorded in an environment and replayed. Uh, there's also the lingering ones. The lingering ones are, you know, they'll be opening your cabins, cabinets at night or moving objects around the house. So you find something in a different location or your dog reacts strangely or, you know, those sorts of things are. And usually those are very uh, transient. It's almost as if they're just walkthroughs. 
Uh, some people feel that there's certain beings that might have died in the house or lived there when they were alive and, and they miss it and they're back there and they're just visiting it. And, and once again, those are usually transient. They can be a couple of weeks, a couple of months, sometimes a couple of years, but it does kind of die down after a time. So really the majority of what scares us about ghosts are what we've seen in scary movies. Um, sometimes depending on your faith, especially I noticed Catholics because uh, they have an assortment of demons and possession and all kinds of beliefs that can affect and manifest for you. So you have to be really cautious of those sorts of things. And um, uh, when you want to get rid of something in your home, you, you're going to need to follow your own faith because I've had people that, you know, had the holy water and had a Catholic priest come in and work on the house, but they were Methodist or they were atheist, you know, and it, it's, it just doesn't work. You need the manifesting aspect of you because the people in the house are part of the melu. So if somebody moves in or out of the house or there's arguments in the home, you'll notice new activity and you are part of the chemistry. So whatever you do, it's got to be something you believe in. And the first thing I tell people is the only thing that's really scaring you usually is you're just surprised. You know, I, you walk down the hallway to get some water and you see a shadow or, you know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden you hear a voice or, you know, and it'll startle you, but it's not hurting you. It's just that crossover moment. Uh, think of it like a radio. You're turning the dial and you're just catching a bit of a song. Uh, so it's not really a threat, but it, what happens inside your head once you've experienced this is probably your biggest threat. You're going to have to work on how you handle the situation. So I suggest just get your power back in the best way. Like, like Sean said, tell them, look, you're, I'm uncomfortable with you being here. Go someplace else. So go someplace you love, you're free to go, you know, whatever. Uh, that's a really good method. And then I also suggest just keep an open spiral notebook. And when something happens, write down the time, write down who was in the house or saw or heard it. You know, just uh, what, what were the emotions going on with the family at that time? Did you just have an argument? You know, just start like what I call is my narc book. You gain more power when you start tattling on the ghost. So now <laughs> you're documenting it. Now it's like afraid to perform. It's like trying to watch somebody when they need to pee, you know, performance anxiety. <laughs> yeah. So um, you get your power back. And now you just can't wait for something to happen. So you can just write it down in your book and tattletale like Cindy Brady. So that, that's a really good way. And then another thing I always say is somewhere in your home, maybe in the center of your home, if you can, just have a table where you put things that have meaning to you. Pictures of people you love. If you, if you are Christian, open a Bible and leave it there. Put plants there, crystals, you know, religious emblems, uh, you know, anything with happy memories. Uh, family heirlooms, things that just empower. It's like an energy center. The more you manifest all the awesomeness and all the love and all the happiness, it sends bad things away. It just does. It's a it's a good feng shui technique. I love that. You say the the word manifest is making me think of the word conjuring for some reason. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and when I think of the word conjuring, <laughs> I think of my older <laughs> sisters are all, they are always telling me, they know how, mm -hmm. how much I miss my mom and dad who are both in heaven right now. And so oh, yeah. they always say to me, uh, no conjuring, don't conjure them, let them rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And then you hear people talk, sometimes you hear the term thrown out, uh, places aren't haunted, it's the people that are haunted. And I wonder mm -hmm. sometimes when, these places that are, you know, notoriously rumored to be haunted, and then they hold ghost hunts there a lot. I wonder how haunted may or may they not have been before all these tours after tour after tour after tour started going <laughs> through there and people hunt ghost hunting, ghost hunting, ghost hunting, ghost yeah. hunting, manifesting or conjuring, conjuring. Mm -hmm. that they've created it as much as if it may or may not have been going on before all of that. Oh, absolutely. As a psychometrist, um, as someone who reads objects and even locations and photos, it doesn't matter. I can get information from these things. But uh, you go to a memorial like the Vietnam Memorial 
And you may not have ever known anyone that was in Vietnam. You may not have, you know, had an attachment to the war itself, but just that location suddenly has you very depressed and very full of grief and you want to cry. And you're like, I don't even know the people that are on this wall, but I just want to cry. And there, it, it, you put enough emotion in one location and it can really stain that location. It can, it can make it bad mojo. So if you move into a new home, and you find that you and your husband are fighting all the time in the pantry and you don't know why. Uh, it could be that that is where the last family had their arguments. So there's ways you can go about sort of retraining an environment with positive energy instead of negative energy because uh, we have trouble as, as ghost investigators proving ghosts. I mean, we can record things or take pictures and all of them can be disputed and they're, and they're not even that clear. It's like, photographing Bigfoot, uh, but the human being is the best receiver and that's because we have a soul. And that is what can help us with the ether. And that's sort of the in-between between us and things we can't see or prove, but we can and psychics use that, that zone. And eventually I think science will explain the method of transport of this, this universal knowledge yeah, it's funny you bring that up uh, because we had a smaller version of it touring the country, if you remember back in the day, and it went to Pahrump here. It's about a 45 minute drive to Pahrump from Vegas and Sharon and I went there to go see the the smaller traveling Vietnam wall. And mm -hmm. I got, I actually got hit by a wall. I couldn't approach it because I got to a certain point where yeah. I just knew that any if I take another step, I'm gonna start bawling like a baby in yeah. front of all these people I don't even know. And there's, of course, there's people up there sketching names. Like yes. Put, sketch. they're, rub they're rubbing their family members' names or their friends. Like they would on a on a tombstone, you know. And, and it was just, I, I got hit by it and I couldn't get any yeah. closer. So I can imagine what going to the one in D.C. is like. Um, yeah. I grew up in the um, D.C. area, so I was used to being near memorials and the feelings. One of my favorite memorials for a feeling of absolute, awe is the Abraham Lincoln Memorial. Nothing beats it. The, the, the collective energy there is, wow. It's like how everybody felt hitting the shore of America and having a chance to do whatever they could do, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm going to feel bad if I don't ask you this question, and we've, we've got a little bit mm -hmm. of time left. Okay. We, we brought up Denny earlier. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. Oh, Denny. Danny, I was worried about him there for a little bit. He went on mm. a lone excursion out yeah. to a place not too far from me here, Area 51, mm -hmm. the extraterrestrial highway. Been on it many times. And he went out there to meet a couple of uh, fellow uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. And he had an incident. He had a serious incident. Serious it it incident. reminded me a lot of the uh, Secret of Skinwalker Ranch because I, I think he was hit by microwave. I'm not sure, but he uh, he had a few electrical issues with his the car, which was a new car, and uh, and then the phone. The phone wasn't working quite right, and uh, a couple of times we were talking because he was trying to. I always wanted to go down the ET highway, so he's talking to me live about this as he's driving along and. Um, at one point we tried to talk to each other and we got an interruption of what sounded like a man in a jet with a helmet screaming. And I just got really annoyed. And I said, Hey, area 51, you know, I'm trying to talk to someone, just <laughs> yeah. cut it out. And all of a sudden the phone went dead. So he's driving along and he's, he gets me back on the phone. He's talking and he goes, Oh my God, I can't believe it. And he, he said, there's three, what would be called saucers uh in metallic saucers in the air and and they're they're just hovering and as he went toward them uh they just took off like really really fast so he pulled over and uh he wanted to try to get a, a you know 360 with the camera and try to capture anything if they came back or if he could still catch them and um he had an experience where every photo came coming off of his camera was scrambled in a way that resembled Skinwalker Ranch when uh, when uh, Eric, the, the scientist, was showing his photographs of how they were interrupted by a microwave signal. And he blacked out, basically. He just, he passed out. He he was having He had lost of time, symptoms. too, big time. He had a loss of time. He, he, but 
it really wasn't necessary. I mean, for him, it was a loss of time, but I was on the other end. And when he, he was, when he, the phone went dead, he'd been complaining about uh, that he, he, he had um, pressure in his head he, and some kind of burn marks or something. And he wasn't feeling good. And then I couldn't get a hold of him. And I tried to call him a couple of times. And all I got was uh, like voicemail answering. And it was some, it sounded like somebody with some weird language. It sounded kind of like an Asian lady, but this was a language I've never heard. And then the second time I called him, it happened again. It somehow on the second ring answered his phone with this weird voice. And I had it on the speaker and my roommate went, oh my God, you know? So we're listening to this going, what's going on? And I'm watching the clock because as a researcher, I always can pull back and, you know, go, okay, I got to remember this. So it was 20 minutes of silence. He gets back um, on the phone with me and he says, I'm, I'm pulling into, um, uh, what's that town there? Uh, oh my gosh. Rachel? Uh, uh, not Rachel, but the, the, um, the one that always has UFO sightings. Uh, oh my gosh, there's so many of them out there that do uh, that. Uh, yeah. Near Area 51 on the way home. I, it's I on, yeah, it's on the way toward Vegas. Um, what is the town? Oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Could it be Pahrump or? Oh, uh, Tonopah, Tonopah. Tonopah, there you go. So he says, I, I'm just entering Tonopah. And I said, wait a minute. Where, where did you ha where did you pull over? And he told me, and he had literally in 20 minutes traveled over a hundred miles. Um, <laughs> so I, oh I, 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 I couldn't explain how, how the heck did he get there? He said, <laughs> I, he said, I woke up That's coming so into Tonopah. So he was unconsciously driving or something, or he was put back in his car and he, he just suddenly awoke, but he had many days there in Tonopah that his, the researcher friends he was going to go on an expedition with, they came racing down there to take care of him because he literally couldn't be trusted to walk out of the room without forgetting where he was and who he was wow. and what room he was in. And he was in exquisite pain. He had burn marks on his arms. Um, it just, it, it was, he was, he was vomiting. I mean, just all the whole reaction was, it sounded very much like he'd been hit by microwave and it took quite some time to get himself back to his strength again. But wow. it was uh, just very bad timing. <laughs> Poor Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad he's doing a lot better. I know he's doing a lot better now, and um, I'm glad you two are both, uh, whatever yeah. you want to call it, uh, do, working together again. <laughs> Look, we'll call it that. I'm so glad that is happening. And, we are. Um, we're we're excellent partners. He he well, can literally finish my sentences for me. So yeah. Before we run out of time, anything you want your fans and followers, especially the people who are just now uh, getting to know you, meeting you, getting to know mm. you, know about you, where they can find your books and recommend for the first time, Sharon Day, reader, which book you would recommend and all that good stuff before we go. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Um, ghosthuntingtheories.com is the blog and anything unexplained that you're interested in, anything, it's on there. there I, I can't think of a subject I haven't hit on that blog. There's a lot of info. On the right-hand side of the blog, you'll find a list of the most popular uh, entries. And those are ones that are extraordinarily researched. And I love to give links because I don't want you to necessarily believe the conclusion I've come to. But if you find it intriguing and you want to research it, I want you to know where I got my info. So it's, I always try to be very transparent. I've got two dozen books <laughs> and you'll find a link to my Amazon page on the, on the right hand side of my blog too. I'm, you can find me on Amazon and Kindle. Um, I have a three book paranormal romance series that I really love. The first book uh, was um, Ghost of a Chance. The second book was Tall, Dark and Elusive. And the third book was Threshold. And each one of those use actual real life case events and information about the subjects. But in a fictional romance setting. So uh, you actually get educated while you're being entertained and thrilled. So it's kind of cool. First one was ghosts, second one was Bigfoot, and the third one was portals. I also had the book Growing Up with Ghosts, which is a uh, award-winning uh, five-star book. And uh, Growing Up with Ghosts is everything that me and my family had experienced in the house I grew up in. And 
vacationing with ghosts is a follow-up, and that is me as a psychic child at our summer home on the Chesapeake. Very different kind of hauntings there. Um, both of those are, are excellent reads that if you love that kind of subject, you're just going to get lost in it. Phenomenal. Thanks. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Please have a great remainder to your Monday evening. Give Denny a big hug and a kiss for I me. Shall. Oh, I will. And I'll have you guys back probably in September. Okay, that'd be perfect. Well, I think we'll be done doing some filming we're working on. Yeah. Very cool. God bless mm -hmm. you. I love you. I'll see you later. Thank you. Too. Good night. Bye. Oh, my gosh. Sharon Day. I told you you guys would all love her by the time the show was over with. I'll see you all next Friday. Cameron Logan, he is a paranormal authority. I love this guy. Ufologist, podcaster, you name it. You're going to love him. That's this coming Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific. I want to thank my co-producers, Zach Clayton, Adrian Hart, Things Network, Temple of Phoenix Rising Entertainment, Skeleton Key Network, Pact, Podcasting for All Coming Together channel for all simulcasting my show. Thank you all so very much for being here. I don't have a show without each and every one of you. You're all on the prayer list. I'll see you Friday. On that note, good night, Danny. Good night, Jack. Good night, dog. Good night, Harold. Rest in peace. Good night, Ernie. Good night, Bill. Good night, Dan. God bless all of you. Peace. <laughs>